Very good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar um, hosted and organized by Sovereign. We've got an excellent range of speakers. And to remind you all, it's Enhancing International Trade and Investment, an insight into, into Japan and the United Kingdom market entry. Um, we're not officially starting yet because there's quite a few of us, uh, or quite a few of you, uh, delegates um, logging in. I can see the count increasing rapidly, uh, but I will sort of um, make a couple of sort of domestic announcements just to confirm that this webinar will be recorded, so you can ac that, access the recording on remote search engines and social media. Uh, we can send you the recording. Um, there will be a follow-up email uh, attaching this presentation, ladies and gentlemen, so that's uh, a useful reference document for yourselves um, after this event, which will probably come tomorrow. So it's being recorded. Um, the presentation will be emailed. And uh, in my windows today um, is uh, Stuart Stobie, a, a colleague of mine, um, uh, who is the Managing Director of Sovereign Corporate and Trustee Services in the Wirral, that's the northwest of England. Um, and we have Samuel Rosen of JTC Services, um, John and Stephen, uh, John Davidge and Stephen Green from Bermans. They are a smart firm of English solicitors. I'm your um, monitor chairperson. Um, I'll be receiving questions from you so post your questions in the question box and um, the uh, the quicker questions i will convey to each speaker as we as we canter through the presentation and please be reminded that there's a very big sort of question and answer session at the end uh, what will happen is after my quick introduction stuart will um, open the batting and start first followed by samuel and Bermans, the representative from Bermans, uh, that will take 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have a questions and answer session, open the floor up, and I will um, be raising questions in favour of the speakers. So I'm the Managing Director of Sovereign UK based in London. Sovereign is a, a global organisation that allows and offers and facilitates international trade worldwide taking European and international companies into new markets such as Africa, um, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, uh, including uh, Japan um, and other nations such as China, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, the first speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to introduce the speakers very quickly, is Stuart Stoby, my colleague in the northwest of England, who has been um, an expert and involved in the uh, corporate trust and fiduciary business for the last 25 years, working in Hong Kong uh, and Gibraltar, the UK, formerly for Grant Thornton, Coots Bank in Switzerland, and um, has been had a, a, a wonderful career with, with Sovereign. Um, Samuel Rosen um, will then follow Stuart, and just by way of background on, on Samuel Rosen, he received a scholarship at Keio University in Tokyo, graduated from the London School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, a degree in Japanese, spent over 20 years working with Japanese companies. He must have started when he was a teenager. Um, the Japanese government, non-government organizations lived in Tokyo, Osaka, uh, and other cities, and aside from Shanghai and Wuxi in China and Singapore, before returning to the UK a few years ago to set up his own company, Japan Transitional, Transnational, sorry, Business and Consulting Services, uh, a key uh, member of our team that will tell you all about market entry towards Japan. Um, so do raise some um, pertinent questions in favor of, of Samuel. Following Samuel, there will be our friends from Bermans. They are a English firm of solicitors. John is the, a partner and head of corporate law. Stephen will be doing most of the talking for Bermans and he's a partner and head of commercial law at Bermans. Heads up the commercial team and advises on all types of commercial contracts and arrangements, um, international cross-border market entry, hence why you've got uh, ourselves sovereign, uh, 
uh, Samuel and Berman's um, cantering us through the morning's presentation, particularly a focus, and a, particularly the focus, the, object, the objectivity and applicability um, is to is for the speakers to analyse the comprehensive economic partnership agreement enabling Japanese investments into the UK, UK market entry towards the Japan, facilitating international companies with the UK to undertake market entry into Japan, outbound Japanese promotion to UK companies seeking to expand internationally. It's all surrounding that very marvellous comprehensive economic partnership agreement that has been signed by both countries. Now, as I complete my introduction, we're now getting a, a better gathering of delegates. So thank you, delegates, for um, arriving on time. Um, and to set the scene before I hand over to Stuart, um, it's clear that Japan is the 11th most populated nation, 125 million people. GDP per capita $44,500, members of the UN, OECD, G7, third biggest economy on the world, highest life expectancy, ladies and gentlemen, um, no surprise there, um, and other um, general facts which will be supplemented and complemented um, by um, Samuel a little bit later on. So I think it's rather relevant now that I offer Stuart to um, move ahead from that introduction. Again, thank you for everyone for attending. The event is going to be recorded. The presentation is going to be emailed. Post your questions, ladies and gentlemen, in the um, question box, and I will facilitate those questions as we move through the speakers. Stuart Stobie, Managing Director of uh, Soaring Corporate for us in the Wirral, the northwest of England. Stuart Stobie. Good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you very much indeed for attending uh, this uh, this webinar. I think the the main intention is is not only just to look at what the um, impact is of SEPA on Japan and the UK, but but also maybe to focus on the fact that regularly Japan is sort of a strange thing to say when you're talking about the third biggest economy in the world is regularly overlooked as a place to trade and do investment with. Um, and thankfully, we have somebody on uh, the panel in the form of Samuel Rosen who can give you uh, further insight that uh, Japan is, is, is definitely worthy of uh, consideration um, and uh, a place to uh, uh, consider trading with, investing in, um, and should n in no way be ignored. Um, we can move on to the next slide of the topic. So, as I say, I, I'm going to just give a brief overview of uh, the UK-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. A nice, easy thing to say. I uh, want to call that SEPA going forward. Uh, you'll also hear me reference GEPA, which is the previous, which is existing agreement between the EU and the UK. And, and I'll also touch on the comprehensive and progressive agreement for trans-pacific partnership they don't make it easy you know the the the, um, the politicians the bureaucrats uh which is which it, it, it involved as, as the name suggests involves the group grouping of um uh the economic grouping of, com uh, of countries around the pacific rim um so in regards to um i, I i'll uh, I'll, I'll give you a um i think the next slide is probably just gives you a brief insight into uh, the um, the uh, the overview of UK uh, uh, Japan trade. I mean, as, as it states there, you can read that quite clearly. Um, you know, it is a, a major trading uh, partner. You know, you got to, as as I stated, Japan is 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 a huge economy, diverse economy, and obviously we're very used to seeing over here uh, large investments into our particular automotive industries by the Japanese. Um, uh, but there is a lot more going on, um, and uh, but and, and as you can see, this is a, this, this, these figures are obviously 
everything unfortunately we are a bit dated when we're waiting for the collation of figures but you know we'll look back in 2000, uh, 2019 sorry there was 31.6 billion pounds worth of trade between the, us our two countries so it, there's a there's a lot going on and, and a lot to analyze and therefore again just to reiterate the main drive of this uh, of, of this webinar is to say consider japan as uh or if you're in japan consider the uk as a place to, to do business uh, and um, don't don't you know we, we, as I say uh, Samuel goes some way to demystifying the inward investment to Japan and hopefully for anybody from Japan listening and that we will help uh, and I'll give you an overview on on the the, the open door policy that UK has um, so if I move on to the next slide which basically started out and I, and I blame John Davidge for this uh, for, for, for making me having to research up on all these various uh, acronyms etc like this because we had, uh, John, John noticed that um, that there was an increase in interest from his own clients John Davidge is he's, he's a partner of Burma as you can see um, on your screen uh, and, and which um, led to the discussion on, on we should be looking at possibility of our own clients here in the UK um or, or, of looking to japan and, and one of the things that obviously had obviously caught the headlines was the first post-brexit uh, uh free trade agreement that uh, uk signed and that was with japan and that's just a little bit over a year ago now um i've given you some sort of um some headlines there um if though if you dig deep into comparing what the um UK, the CEPA versus, as I say, GEPA, which is, as I said, the European Union agreement with Japan. In terms of actual tariff-free trade, there isn't a great amount of difference. There's a fair amount of copying and pasting, it has to be said, in terms of what's happened there. Uh, so, so, so why the big headline about uh, about CEPA? Well, it, it, it is basically, as I said, it's the first. Uh, it's an indication of the UK's desire to sign. Uh, foreign trade agreements. It's a blueprint, you could say, for the free trade agreements that uh, the UK is looking to sign, and, and therefore maybe something to model ourselves on. But it, it, though, though I say in terms of tariff, it obviously does. It, me it meant that we didn't have to worry, look to World Trade Organization rules on, on when trading with Japan. Again, there's arguments over whether that would make much difference, but it, it, it means that there is a conversation going on between the Japanese and UK governments on the freedom, uh, free flow of goods, the tariff uh, free flow of goods, sorry, between our two nations. Um, the, the key thing, I think, particularly for, for, for SMEs who are more and more operating uh, through, say, e commerce means it, it before, uh, previously, and within the EU, the EU had a very a uh, strong policy on data protection uh, uh, and protecting the individual's uh, data and therefore was very anti the, the, the free flow of, of data across borders uh, outside the EU, which is you've probably seen some uh, headlines about that with the, with the big tech companies in, in the US uh, pushing for change. Um, the, the key difference here for, for, um, for anybody involved in e-commerce is that there, there, there's been a, a, a change in in, in the uh, the regulation in terms of the transfer of data between uh, between Japan and the UK? In other words, it's a free flow of it. You can move it across border. Obviously, you're subject to data protection rules. We have to be guided by, but it, it does allow for uh, say e-commerce companies over here to uh, when they're trading with Japan to keep all the data over here. Uh, um, we, we, there'll be caveats on that but that's that's the basic framework so it does it does does mean you don't have to go setting up servers in japan but that way um as therefore keeps your your overheads down um there have been some improvements so they're trying to in terms of financial services there's trying to be a level out leveling out or, or, or of the playing field particularly uk financial services obviously which is a major part of our economy uh going into japan uh, and basically there are rules there to trying to level up the playing field where uh uk uh, uh financial services company can offer the same financial services offered by uh, uh japanese financial services obviously you have to be regulated under the japanese rules but it, it does create a more level playing field uh going forward it, it, there's still a fair amount of way to go on that, but there is uh, intrinsic within the CEPA, uh, there is 
a, a, a clause basically saying that the, the two regulatory authorities governing financial services in Japan and UK will talk to each other about uh, about trying to get away with the, moving the red tape out of the way for Japanese and UK financial services wanting to move into each other's markets. Um, as, as I said, in, the, 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 in terms of tariff-free trade, it, there's not much change between the, the, the one we were subject to under EU, but there has been a slight liberalisation of rules of origin. For example, if you are a UK manufacturer and you get a number of your, your parts from the EU, um, effectively, and I caveat this, effectively, the uh, rule of or, rules of origins uh, rules um, uh, allow you to include basically designate EU parts as UK parts, so it's still meaning that it's deemed a UK product and therefore subject to the same rules as, as um, uh, 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 under super in terms of the tariff-free trade. Um, there is increased, obviously for key brands, we, the, the UK brands, obviously there's a big market for high quality British brands uh, in the far east, Japan is no exception. Um, uh, and obviously, the, the, the big brands want to, want to be able to protect the, protect their, uh, the, the recognition uh, of those key UK brands, uh, and, and there is clauses within SEPA to do that. So, so these, which which leads on to the enhanced provisions on on IT IP protection. There has been, in terms of actually moving people between the two jurisdictions for business purposes, there's been a slight liberalisation of that process as well. Japan seemed to be. A little bit more ahead of the game than our own home office. I don't think that's probably surprising to anybody. Um, in terms of the ease of people, for, um, uh, persons uh, moving from the UK to Japan as part of a business investment, um, it, it, it's, it's much easier. Uh, the UK is committed to a 90-day process to, to process those those, those business visas, um, uh, but again. The clear policy has not been is, is not there yet, but, but it's getting there. Of more, in terms of the UK, obviously post Brexit and actually pre Brexit, there was a lot of the the, the, the pro Brexit politicians saying that the the leave the leaving of the EU will give us a, a greater of um, opportunity to look outside the EU for uh, for global um, opportunities in terms of uh, uh, free trade deals with other countries. Um, as I mentioned, that massive, great big, um, the, 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 uh, the uh, business, uh, the, the, the Pacific Rim sort of business, um, sorry, uh, 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 a business community of, of countries, which is, as I said, the Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which includes countries such as Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam. Basically, this agreement with Japan, Japan has undertaken under this agreement to help promote our, 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 us joining. And we have applied to join this organization, um, which is very much focused on free mm -hmm. trade. It's helping to knock down barriers. As you can see, there's a number of developing uh, economies in that grouping, and it's unusual for those economies to just drop barriers to allow uh, <coughs> foreign in, um, access across the board. That is what this, this arrangement uh, of this grouping of countries is meant to do. It is based on free trade. You would, you would get the Brexit guys arguing that is basically what the EU should basically be. It's a simple free trade arrangement, uh, but basically by, so it will give us access to a, a far greater uh, a, a market. It is a big market, I think, it constitutes about 15% of, 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 uh, of, of, of the global GDP. So it is a substantial, uh, gives us substantial access to new markets without having to sign individual agreements with each of those countries. So there are clear uh, benefits uh, for it. Um, I think I've gone on long enough in terms of getting a nod from the chairman that I should, should basically pass on to Tamil, who basically is the star uh, show here because obviously he has the greater insights into Japan and obviously uh, as a Brit himself also doing business here. So I will pass it back thank to you, Chair. Thank you very much you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Samuel, I think uh, you're on mute so uh, speakers uh, to avoid the background noise, I think you've got to unmute. Uh, for those late arrivals, thank you delegates for attending and giving your undivided attention. Um, one of the highlight uh, talks of uh, this webinar will be from Samuel. 
Um, and apart from just uh, telling you a quick brief about Samuel, but I did this before, uh, Samuel um, spent a major amount of time in Japan, notwithstanding he returned in 2019 to establish his own company, Japan Transnational Business and Consulting. Um, but he spent multiple years in Japan, but formerly was um, involved in and working for the British Consulate General in Osaka, uh, the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program in Japan. In Japan. Uh, he's worked with Toyota, and he actually was famous uh, famous for signing the midfielder Osaka for Bolton Wanderers. So he's represented good old Bolton as well. Someone has to. Uh, but seriously, uh, one of the highlights of uh, this webinar is listening to um, um, Samuel. Whoops. Samuel, uh, there we are, doing business in Japan. Samuel Rosen. Samuel, good morning and please continue. Good morning, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. And good morning to uh, everybody who's listening here in uh, the UK and on this side of the world. Uh, for anybody who is tuning in from uh, Japan on the other side, uh,本日、誠にありがとうございます。え、お疲れ様です。え、今日は主に日本の方で海外を考えてしたら、え、我々JTBCServices並びにソフトウェアグループ、ファーマンス、法律事務所はえ、ご支援できますので、ぜひご
um, is the SME, so the smaller companies. So this makes up over 90% of the companies in Japan. Um, so that's about 3 million companies or, or thereabouts. Um, and a lot of these are very focused on the Japanese market. Um, and this has led to something called the Galapagos effect, where Japanese SMEs have specifically developed their products and services for Japan. Um, and this is now starting to change a little bit. And um, why is that starting to change? Well, there's a couple of factors. So one is that about 2.5 million of these SMEs, uh, the managing director or the, the people in charge, the, the sort of high top management level, will be over 70 years old by 2025. So what's happened is that in the last couple of years, there's been a really strong drive to bring younger people coming up, working their way up the business, into management positions in SMEs. Um, these guys are very, very skilled. Um, often they've been with the company since they left school. And so they're very, very familiar with their own products and services. But at the same time, uh, since the 1980s, there's been a very strong drive from the Japanese government to internationalize Japanese people. And these younger people will have come through that system. So although they maybe don't speak English particularly well, um, they will be more focused on the idea of expanding beyond Japanese borders and at the same time also more welcoming of foreign companies looking to do business with them in Japan, uh, invest with them or set up some kind of cooperative uh, arrangement with them, whether that's a joint venture or, or some other format. But the people who are coming up, so this is people maybe in their late 30s and 40s, uh, sometimes in their 50s, will be a lot more international and internationally minded than the generation uh, before. Um, and so this is a, a real sort of new opportunity that hasn't been there before, um, even in the, the 1980s, which was probably one of the, the last times that it was uh, you know, seen as a good time to, to invest in Japan. Um, all of these new opportunities are really sort of coming to the, to the front now. Um, so these are the sort of long-term overall trends. Uh, just to focus in specific, because I, I did put it on the slide about uh, Koizumi san and Abisan. So Koizumi was the the first guy to really sort of push for a new Japan. So this is bearing in mind laying the foundations for the economic rebuilding uh, after the bursting of the bubble. So he was pushing to to, to modernize, to drive sort of more international international practices into the Japanese workplace uh, and into Japanese society uh, in general, and to try and sort of push. The, the smaller companies, not quite down to the to the, the SME level, but the sort of the bottom end of the big players, to get them to more to be more international as well, um, and that sort of played through into the beginning of the Abe years. So Abe obviously is famous for his so-called three arrows of economic policy, um, which have been, depending on who you ask, more or less effective. Um, but one of the the key things that came out during um, Abe's very long uh, tenure as prime minister were the silver economy and a sort of secondary policy which was womanomics. Um, so what's the silver economy and why is it important? Well there's over 600 trillion yens worth of assets in Japan locked up in people who are effectively retired and one of the drivers for this silver economy was to bring them back into the workplace. So to get them to come on not just sort of doing part-time work in um, you know, coffee shops and, and um, you know, convenience stores, but to actually get them to re-engage with companies, so come back on as advisors uh, and, um, you know, non-executive directors and this sort of thing. Uh, and so even people who are older, they have a lot of experience and they're still respected in Japan. And so to get them, sort of drag them out of retirement, as well as getting them to engage um, with businesses, was engaging that part of the economy. So, so bringing out some of that locked up, trapped wealth, not just of knowledge, but also financial, actual, you know, cash wealth that's, that's locked up there. Um, and at the same time, we have womenomics, um, which for those of us in the West seems like a, maybe a little bit of a strange or a sort of obsolete concept. Um, but the driver behind it, despite what you might see in the news, the driver behind it wasn't so much for equality. Um, so over here in the West, when we talk about women in the workplace, a lot of it is about equality and, and you know, making sure we have equal opportunities and equal pay and, and this sort of thing. 
But in Japan, the main driver behind womenomics was that you have this massively untapped resource, half of the population not actually engaging in work. So the, the women in the offices where I was working um, generally fall into the categories of what are called OL, office ladies, answering phones, making tea, photocopying, bringing documents to managers, this sort of thing. And it was recognized, uh, in, particularly in the Abbey years, that this was really a massively underutilized resource and it was worth, all of these women were coming out of universities, well-trained, you know, absolutely ready to engage with the workplace and it was an untapped resource. Um, and so this idea of bringing women into the workplace, womenomics, um, has been a really strong driver for plugging some of the gaps um, in the working population in Japan because obviously we've had the aging, so people retiring, a lower birth rate, and so that left a lot of sort of gaps in traditional areas in Japan, which have um, certainly over the past 10 years or 15 years begun to be increasingly filled by women. And this has actually carried on and it's being pushed further uh, under Kishida, who came in last year, um, with his um, his uh, committee for entrepreneurs, where 50% of the, the people on that committee are in fact women, so female entrepreneurs in Japan, which links to uh, another uh, very interesting trend, which has um, has come out of COVID, which is a, a massive uh, explosion in startups. So. Historically, yes, there have been startups in Japan, but they've not tended to be so many. People tend to come out of school, uh, university, and go straight into an established company. Uh, it's a very established path, a very established way of doing things. And so to have this massive explosion of startups that has happened during COVID is, a, is another really, really exciting uh, economic trend that we're seeing in Japan. Um, and this is, of course, we've seen similar things here in the UK where during lockdown, People couldn't go into the office. They were sitting at home doing work from home. And it, it's conducive to having side projects, which you can then sort of monetize and, and you know, turn into a, a company. And this is something that's also happened um, in Japan. Uh, so along with that, um, obviously, the change into technology like that that we're using today, web conferences, um, this is something which Japanese people before COVID really, really shied away from. Um, you know, you had to sign uh, extra documents to take your computer out of the office and, and there were so many complications and everything, you know, if you had to have something done, you'd have to, even when I was working in Singapore, I'd have to fly back to Osaka to have certain documents stamped and to, to do things in, you know, that traditional office environment. COVID obviously has changed that across the world and Japan is no exception. Um, and that is really, um, you know, played into changing the dynamics of the way people work uh, over there. Um, as I said before, the new generation of leaders coming up into management positions are starting to sort of chip away at this Galapagos uh, effect, you know, this idea of developing products and services specifically just for Japan. Okay, they've got used to buying things online. They've got used to you, you know, your global players like, like Amazon, for example they know that you can have a product and service and if you tweak it so that it's not just for Japan, you can sell that overseas. And similarly, they can, they're looking, actively looking for products and services to bring into Japan that traditionally wouldn't have been there. They'd have, they'd have just said, okay, well, we've got this particular company in say Osaka or Kyoto or Nagoya, which does this thing and, and we're happy with that. We're, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're content to do that. But now, because people are, you know, doing so many more things online, they're able to look beyond that and say, well, okay, internationally, there's this company doing this in the UK, there's this company doing that in France, and they're far more open to suggestions of, you know, new ways to do business and, and new um, products and services. Uh, and then just just a final word, because that's I'm just hitting the, the 15 minute mark there. Um, at the, the upper end, we've also seen a lot of outward looking investment from other companies, so companies like SoftBank, uh, Kanden, so the Osaka Electric Power Company who've uh, invested here in the Northwest, uh, Rakuten, looking beyond Japan to build new business relationships. So all the way from the very top, the, you know, the top end, you know, people like SoftBank, to the very bottom, these brand new startups in places like Fukuoka in Shikoku in, in uh, Kagawa Prefecture in Takamatsu, all of these companies are now 
opening themselves up to doing business with non-Japanese companies. This is a huge shift and it, it really, really offers an amazing um, opportunity going forward. And, and that's something that I think, um, you know, certainly Sovereign and, and Bermans and, and, and JTBC, we can all sort of tap into and, and help you who are watching today uh, take advantage of that. Thank you. Samuel, just a, a quick question um, as we want to stay with questions relevant to everybody's talk here. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this is this webinar is recorded and it will be available if uh, colleagues and associates that can't attend can uh, listen, in, listen into it later and the presentation is going to be uh, emailed to you separately. But in terms of when you break it down, persons that wish to do business with Japan, that's non-Japanese people doing business with Japan, uh, what is the expectation uh, of language. Obviously, visiting Japan is a little bit different to relocating. Uh, so I imagine, as you said, the, the um, population is immensely educated. So English conversation and the, the ease of doing business in English before you commit to doing business in, before you commit to relocate in Japan. But then what is the expectation if Stuart and I set up a business and we moved to Japan, um, how long will the population give us to try and speak to the same fluency as you have and you uh, can uh, undertake uh, Samuel what's the what's the what's the rule on the ground on that one please um, I would say there's a very 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 big caveat there um, which is that Japanese basic Japanese is not too difficult to to learn um, I can teach people you know the the two syllabaries uh, a few characters uh, in a you know a couple of hours session and that will give you sort of basics. But Japanese business is very, very, very nuanced. Um, and to learn the differences and the, the ways of address and, and things that can cause offense and in completely unintentionally, to understand that is actually a very, very complex process and it takes many, many, many years. Uh, to give you an example, I've worked with uh, some people who have very proficient Japanese um, where I've been sort of taking a second seat where I've been representing a company and they've, they've sort of another company's brought in a person as an interpreter and that person uh, a Brit just uh, in this particular instance had learned Japanese from mainly from his girlfriend and in, in nightclubs and bars so the Japanese that he was using in the meeting was certainly understandable but for example there are verbs in Japanese that are used only by women there are forms of address that are only used by women and if they sort of slip into the the conversation over business, it gives completely the wrong impression. And of course, right. there's the famous sort of adage that Japanese people don't say no, which is sort of true. There is a word in Japanese for no, which is e e f. But people don't say no, and what they what they prefer to do instead is give their answer in terms of a probability. And by giving a certain answer in a certain way, you can gauge whether that is a 10% chance of yes, 20%, 70%, 80%, or 100%. And so being able to gauge those nuances in the conversation um, is something which takes many, many, many years to, um, to perfect. Wow. And for that reason, I would really, really recommend, rather than trying to sort of do it yourself, get somebody who actually knows uh, what they're doing and can, can do this for you so that you make the right impression at the beginning, uh, yeah. rather than saying something unfortunate and knocking it knocking it on the head right from the outset all right thank you very much samuel other questions will be raised ladies and gentlemen delegates uh, please post your questions in the, in the question box and i will get make sure as chairman uh, that your question is raised and answered um positively so we're now going to move uh to berman's law firm the law firm of Bermans, um, represented today by John Davidge, partner, and Stephen Green, um, who I introduced at the start. So rather than duplicate what I introduced, uh, Stephen is going to take the lion's share of, of this, uh, this talk, this mini talk, um, before we head back to Stuart and then open everything for, for questions. Legal aspects of international trade. Stephen Green. Great, thanks, Simon. Um, I, I think actually the question there you just raised to Simon, uh, sorry, to Samuel, kind of picks up nicely on um, 
my first point, which is, is around contractual documentation. So one of the um, big challenges always with um, any kind of legal aspects of trade internationally um, is having in place the correct, or correct contractual documentation. Now that might be contracts, it might be bills of lading, it might be customs declarations, it might be invoices, whatever whatever that looks like in, in your industry and sector. But I think one of the keys there is is having it in a, in a format that's appropriate for, for the Japanese market. And then also, if necessary, having it in, in, in a dual language. So if you've got English on one side and then Japanese on the other, but having something that, that people in Japan can understand um, and deals with a lot of the, um, the key issues and challenges that, that are faced with, with trading in Japan. So I think that the first point kind of comes nicely from, from Samuel's talk there in that having in place contractual documentations that actually are fit for purpose and also um, deal with the best practices and, and language and cultural uh, barriers that, that may be um, in play in Japan. Um, leading on from, from the contractual documentation is, is, is and looking at some of the other big challenges and risk is around um, delivery and, and who's going to take delivery and responsibility for, for any goods that are um, that, that, that may be uh, moved for, to uh, from from wherever in the world into Japan and, and any logistics arrangements that might take place. Um, obviously, transporting goods anywhere these days has its, its own challenges and risks, uh, particularly when you're transporting goods um, uh, on the sea. So having in place um, a, a clear understanding of, of who's responsible for risk, um, who's responsible if there are any issues with that transportation, and then backing it up with, with appropriate insurance as well. And again, um, when you're trading internationally, it's it's having insurance that, that covers you not only for the, the country or jurisdiction that you're working yourself, but also um, moving those goods from, from one jurisdiction to another. Um, I mentioned there in the slide that the, the term or phrase INCO terms, um, it's one of the, the kind of legal mechanisms, if you like, for, for moving goods um, around the world and, and is kind of generally understood um, in most jurisdictions as, as having a certain meanings depending on, on the income terms you've used. So um, it's it's building those, building those risks and issues into your contractual documentation and understanding how that's going to work um, in terms of um, moving particularly goods, but we'll come on to some other issues later on around, um, around services. Um, the next point on the slide is, is, is payment terms. Um, again, there is always going to be risks when you're dealing with um, uh, suppliers or customers in, in foreign jurisdictions. So it's making sure that you've got um, that you're not sorry unduly exposed in terms of, of payment terms and, and how you get paid and when you get paid. Um, sorry, my lights switched off. There we go. Um, so yeah, looking at whether how you want to structure any payment mechanism, so you're not buying yourself at the end of any supply of either goods or services with a, a big debt that you're then looking to chase, and, and whether that is getting money up front, whether that's getting money in instalments, um, not leaving too much of the the payment to the end. Um, I know that that Stuart touched on this in in his talk around data protection and, and the movement of data. Um, I think Stuart mentioned it, it and it is slightly easier to um, to, to move data from um, the, the UK to Japan. Um, Japan has been recognised as a, an, an adequacy um, jurisdiction for the purpose of GDPR, so that transfer of, of data is a lot easier. Um, but there are still things certainly within the UK that you need to do to make sure that you are compliant with GDPR even if you are moving data or transfer of data from from the UK to um, to Japan now whether that is having in place appropriate processing agreements um, having the necessary consents and approvals under your privacy policies um, and also more kind of practical um, considerations things like has your um, supplier or customer in Japan got necessary appropriate security measures for the data and the storing of data, making sure that they're not um, at risk in terms of a data breach or a data hack. Um, there's a lot of talk in the, the, the press recently about data hacks and, and organizations being hacked. So 
again, it's making sure that your customers and suppliers have appropriate uh, measures in place to, to deal with any um, risks around handling and storing data, um, and particularly personal data. Obviously, data is, is key these days, but, but the, the obligations, particularly around personal data, are very strict uh, within Europe, So, uh, and also, as I understand it, within Japan as well. Um, moving on again to I think something that that um, Stuart mentioned earlier in his presentation around intellectual property um, brands trademarks um, those, those two points really work hand in hand and making sure that you are when dealing in any sort of arrangements that that might be um, high tech in particular might be pharmaceutical related having a look at your intellectual property and, and whether you are going to leave yourself exposed in terms of any trading arrangements um, around intellectual property. Um, obviously, one of the one of the the, the, the big uh, things that come out of the new the free trade agreement is the additional rights and protections that are granted um, for for intellectual property and, and in particular trademarks. Um, but it's it's looking at your trademarks portfolio, for example, do you have um, the necessary trademarks in Japan. Have you have you covered that jurisdiction? Have you also looked at, at, at trademark protection for for other countries in and around Japan where there, there might be a risk of um, exposure or, or, or people um, piggybacking off your your brand? So um, having a look at those, making sure that you've got um, the protection for any trademarks or patents. Um, and then again, I'll, I'll probably deal with the, the, the last two points together, uh, picking up I think what uh, we talked about at the start, but also what Samuel mentioned around languages and cultural issues. So um, I think the, the, the Japanese culture is, is, is a very respectful culture, and I think you need to, to bear that in mind when dealing with any trading arrangements, um, whether that is um, contracting on, on their language or, or dealing in their language, whether you're speaking to the right people within the organizations, um, but having those kind of language and cultural um, differences um, in mind. And, and that's where someone like Samuel can, can really add value, I think, when it comes to any contractual legal processes is, is understanding those because the last thing you want to do is to go into a contractual ne negotiation um, using a form or, or a method that may be working for you within Europe, um, but with the with the the language barriers and also the the levels of respect in Japan, um, that you actually have those um, some guidance on on how those um, arrangements work. Um, and then again, finally, um, there will be specific laws, specific um, jurisdiction issues that you'll need to consider when when trading in in Japan. So. Um, it's having an understanding of what they are, but also getting getting advice from professionals, whether that's lawyers or, or, or accountants. Um, I know when, when uh, Stuart and Samuel and I spoke about this presentation a couple of the weeks ago, one of the things we talked about was was tax advice as well, making sure that you've got the best tax advice when it comes to, to moving goods, understanding how customs duties work, um, all the forms that go with that, but also making sure that you're not leaving yourself unduly exposed um, from a tax point of view and understanding sort of paying your taxes both in both in the UK and also potentially in Japan. Um, I think that probably finishes my presentation. So back over to you, Simon. And, uh, yeah, Stephen, thank you for questions. that. Um, under, under brand protection uh, in the UK, pursuant to English law, of course, um, there is uh, sort of traditional routes to protect uh, a corporate brand, their image, uh, the trademark, even the patent, with uh, a superior aspect of law, uh, which perhaps we take for granted. To some extent, you have it in the US, but uh, obviously it depends on which US state you're involved, you're, you're trading or based in. In terms of Japan, and certainly not taking for granted, put you on the spot here, and Stephen, uh, Samuel may be able to help you out as well, maybe, but um, registration of IP in Japan, getting both sides, both countries duly recognized, protected um, from, from the unknown. What do you say about that? 
I think um, I think it probably picks up on one of my points earlier about um, trademarks and, and brand protection. So there is the ability to be able to sorry my light's gone again. The ability to um, to register a trademark in Japan, which which massively helps, and and also in, in, in patents as well. There will be a a, 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 a process a, a, a probably as similar to the intellectual property office here in the UK that you can easily register trademarks within Japan. Um, and I think that they will be respected probably a bit more than, than maybe some of the other Asian Asian countries, um, thinking particularly China here, for example, where um, trademarks are certainly, until very recently, not really been worth the paper they've been written on. Whereas Japan, it is a lot more respectful culture. So having that trademark, um, I think, as a real value, and and, and 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 we've talked a lot about trademarks here, but but similarly patents as well. Um, getting obviously with the, the pharmaceutical industry in Japan, it, it, it's very buoyant that having patents etc. as well in Japan will be uh, critical if, if you've got those um, registered within other jurisdictions. Um, and then also, I think something we've, we've probably not touched on is at this stage is, is licensing. So if you are going to to trade in Japan. Um, if you are looking at uh, setting, uh, appointing a distributor, for example, it's making sure that you have the, the necessary licenses in place um, with those um, distributors or, or, or suppliers that, that actually gives you some contractual protection as well, on top of and above the potential trademarks or patents that you have, for example. Okay. I don't know whether that's fair, Samuel, or whether there's... Uh, you Are want you to add to that? part of that um, worldwide convention of intellectual property? I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, I think a, a, lot, a lot of countries are. Uh, it still means um, getting your uh, trademark registered within the UK and then, then looking effectively to transfer that over to Japan. So, yeah, um, there are, I think, as Stuart mentioned, under the, under the, the trade agreement itself, some, some good okay. mechanisms that, that, that uh, build on that. Okay. And one question back to Samuel from the floor. What is it like for a non-Japanese lady relocating to undertake a business startup uh, to expand the business? She may not be doing it alone, of course, but putting overseas ladies in the forefront of the picture. How's that, Samuel, uh, given the sort of um interesting traditions the con the good country has certainly um so first of all just just to um cut back to to the the previous point about ip um yeah. as has already been mentioned um in japan uh, you can certainly register um trademarks and, and patents and things over there uh, and also as has been mentioned what is very important and, and something that i would just like to emphasize um, is that unlike a lot of other jurisdictions in in, in Asia, um, they do respect, uh, they do tend to respect them. So um, you won't find suddenly um, something with your name with one letter change, um, you know, circulating and, and, and available for sale on the internet at half the price. That's something that just doesn't happen uh, in Japan. So that's one thing to a very sort of positive point about uh, working over there. Uh, to address the, the question from the lady uh, about doing um, business in Japan, um, this is actually a little bit of a difficult area. So traditionally, um, in certain, particularly within certain market areas and certain sectors in Japan, um, the respect for women is, is not quite uh, at what, we, what we're used to uh, in the West. Um, having said that, um, there has been a lot of uh, change. Again, as I said before about uh, the um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, womenomics, um, so with a lot more women coming into the workplace and not just, you know, being um, office ladies answering phones, there is more acceptance um, of uh, women in Japan. It tends to be, certainly at the management level, it tends to be in certain particular industries or, or market sectors. So, for example, uh, maternity, um, medical uh, care, these kind of very traditional areas um, will tend to have more women further up. But we are seeing women across boards, um, across the country. And one thing that's probably very uh, useful to note is that uh, under Kishida's new policy with this um, entrepreneur committee, they're trying to really focus on women who are 
at the top of their profession. You know, so, so you know, having a female managing director treated in the same way uh, as a male managing director would be in Japan. Um, okay. Having said that, if you're a foreign woman, I would very much recommend that you try and team up with somebody uh, in Japan who will be your local support. I mean, that goes for, for anywhere, for any uh, person, but particularly for, uh, for a lady wishing to do business in Japan as a, as a startup. Okay, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, delegates, uh, please post your, your questions. Um, and because we're going to have some time towards the end, our Stuart's going to hoover up here quickly, please, Stuart, uh, so we can take some additional questions or I can raise questions to the audience. Why the United Kingdom? Uh, Stuart Stanley. Thanks, Simon. I, I will, I'm very conscious of time, so I'll, I'll, I will briefly uh, review. And I'm very conscious, obviously, there's probably more of a waiting of people looking at Japan rather than vice versa. So, basically, uh, the, mar the UK is, is, as, is, is one of the more open economies. It's, it's, it's easy to establish here. Obviously, current geopolitical issues, uh, there is going to be more uh, scrutiny of people setting up over here. But uh, if, you, if you're about border, not from certain countries, you shouldn't have an issue. Um, it is obviously a highly developed uh, uh, economy. Um, it's, I mean, it's, uh, in terms of actually doing business, it, it's right up there at the, the top of any chart that you that, that, that you see. Um, it is a, as a place to put your headquarters. Uh, it, it still remains one of the, if not the, the one of the lower tax uh, jurisdictions in in the UK despite the sort of leveling up of, of taxation across the globe um, uh, and there is obviously a, a, a massively one of the biggest financial markets and therefore access to capital uh, available in London, in, in London um, which is extended out throughout the country particularly with the government policy here of leveling up. I think one of the in terms of setting up the UK you know the, the company corporation it, it, it I won't go into that side of things, but I think basically, if you're looking to set up in the UK and you've got um, out of the uh, of all the four panelists here, we're all based up in the Northwest. Um, there and is in terms of doing business, look beyond London and the Southeast. There is uh, an awful lot going on. It is obviously London's an incredibly expensive place to establish a business and, and, and employ staff, and etc. The overheads are huge. Whereas if you look outside of uh, of London, uh, particularly if you're not the even if you are in the financial service sector, right across every sector, there there is highly trained human uh, human resources. Um, you know, we're, we're you know we're right up there in terms of it, it, I think almost top of the charts in terms of tertiary education within within Europe, um, and, and so there is a, a very very dynamic and qualified um, uh, human resource here. There is in terms of the northwest northeast there's there's there's, there's it's much much cheaper to do business. It's very much more uh, focused on the uh, on the on the commercial uh, and not just the financial. So there's a of opportunity up here and also the local governments and the local city governments are are, 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 are take all sorts of um uh, incentives and, and onboarding and, and welcoming you to the uk to help help you set up it easily rather than what we simply do in terms of just in terms of we obviously do this more than this but we'll incorporate your company for you and get all the money etc you know assist with visas etc and you'll have the, the, the legal side with them samuel obviously if you're coming from japan will guide you through the the the, the 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 language side of things uh, to help you translate, but it's it, it it is there is so many opportunities across the UK. Uh, so I, part again is is to look beyond London and the southeast. There is far more in the UK. I I'm again I think I will just leave it at that, Simon, because I think uh, I, I think otherwise we're um again this 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 override this is just an emphasis on the fact that okay. there are also some the, benefits tax-wise for doing business here so I will move on. The presentation is going to be sent to you all tomorrow yeah. at the very least and the presentation and the webinar is being recorded ladies and gentlemen so um, very useful points to make. I would compliment Stuart on that. Um, the Japan is ranked the most 29th easiest place to do business um, so that is no surprise but I'm glad it's uh, in the in the twenties, uh, incidentally, the United Kingdom is the sixth most easiest place to do business in the world, and that's actually after Brexit, COVID, and the uh, 
other challenges that, uh, um, which I won't mention, the political challenges of the world today, but um, that is still number six, uh, notwithstanding that the UK has signed 147 uh, double tax treaties in the world. Um, so clearly, um, Japan and the UK are pioneering uh, business um, reciprocity between nations and other nations. A, a question, um, a general question, is probably for um, Samuel. Um, when you look at Japan as a point of business expansion for a UK or a European company in order to set up, expand and take Japan so seriously they want to set up a business um, and deploy proper working real capital. What are the regional differences? Does everyone um, head to Tokyo or are you a bit of a Stuart Stoby mind? Um, don't just focus on the capital. There's more to the there's more to Japan than Tokyo and more to the UK than London, so to speak. What do you say about that, Sam? Um, I am very much um, of a Stuart Stoby mind on that. Um, so yes, obviously there are great attractions uh, to setting up in Tokyo. Um, it's a very international city. It's well connected. You've got the two major airports there, Haneda and Narita. But um, what people sort of tend to forget, it's the same as we have in the UK, where people out of, outside the UK just think UK equals London. It's very much uh, not the case in Japan. So you obviously have the second uh, center, which is the Kansai region around uh, Osaka and, and Kyoto and, and that, that side of things, which is also massive uh, in terms of business and very different business cultures um, in, the, in the different regions. But aside yeah. from that, um, each of the 47 prefectures has its own prefectural government. Uh, and just as we've got Hello Manchester, you know, up here in, in, in the north and, and similar, there are other programs available from other uh, cities. Um, there are similar things in Japan. So different regions uh, will offer different incentives to set up uh, there. So, for example, uh, there's Fukuoka, which is well known for its startups down in Kyushu. Uh, on Shikoku uh, Takamatsu, which is uh, in uh, Kagawa Prefecture, they have a variety of incentives. They have, a, for example, a business park for startups, uh, and a lot of them have um, sort of incubator programs to sort of facilitate new investment uh, into, the, into the regions. So, yes, Tokyo obviously is well known and everybody knows about it, but I would very much recommend looking to the regions, to the second cities, the tertiary cities, you know, places like Nagoya, Takamatsu, Fukuoka, even Osaka. Um, again, and as, as Stuart pointed out, uh, the costs uh, just of, of setting up and getting things done, getting an office are far lower uh, in these areas. And also as a new investment or a new startup, you will get a lot of extra help um, in, in doing that sort of thing. I would say, Samuel, if, Lo if Stuart complains that London's a little expensive, I think Tokyo competes with that sort of cost, doesn't it? It's even more expensive. It, so it regional, regional persuasion and um, research is needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Um, another question, but we've got a few minutes and there's the majority of the delegates are still um, in the room. So thank you for staying on just a little bit, a little bit longer, but we're cantering through some questions. Um, question for sort of uh, John, Stephen and maybe Samuel can complement um, the answer on, on this one. Um, what are the high level challenges with investing into Japan? That's contributing loan or share capital and really physically investing in terms of um, setting up in Japan. Uh, your experience, please, gentlemen starting with John or Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I think it all goes back to, to researching the market and doing your commercial, financial, tax and legal due diligence. So you need to make sure that, you know, that, that, that for entering any any jurisdiction, but in, in particular Japan, you need, you need your partners on the ground. So whether that's through Sovereign or through Samuel, make sure you've got your team with you in the market research before you go in, 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 into, into that jurisdiction. Um, and, I, and again, that'll set the framework, for instance, if you're looking at just doing a joint venture or selling products into Japan, there'll be a different high level uh, expectation of what you do from brand recognition and, and protection 
if you're buying a company, obviously you need to make sure you've got the correct uh, due diligence team on the ground, the, the correct lawyers. Now, traditionally, you'd probably plug for the you know, a, maybe a city of London firm or, or one of the big four, but we've actually got a, a really good network of uh, lawyers and, and connections through Sovereign and Samuel and, and, and deals we've done in the area that could assist that. But I think with anything going into a new territory, preparation is key um, before you're committing capital. And, and again, you know, knowing the correct banks to, to go with that deal with SMEs rather than the, the PLCs is essential as well because there'll be cultural differences within those organisations as well. So from my perspective, that they're the areas you need to concentrate on. Very good. Very good. Thank you. I would point out that you've not heard a great deal in terms of what Sovereign does on a daily basis. That's not the purpose of the broadcast and it's not uh, not to um, not to sort of spend too much time on this. But Stuart and myself have, you know, four decades of experience, um, shows our age, I suppose, in, in helping SMEs, not just in the UK, SMEs across the globe, uh, looking to practically expand into Africa, uh, that's the continent of Africa, the Middle East, that's every Gulf nation, um, and, uh, sorry, Southeast and other parts of Asia, Hong Kong, China, um, Singapore, and Japan, as well as a little close to home, which might be ironically sometimes easier, Europe and foreign companies seeking to come into the UK on all the practicality, not just the theory, um, obviously relying on Berman's and the specialist and unique services that Stephen delivers, of course, for Japan, but it's down to the formation, the immigration, the visas, the market entry, HR, VAT registration or sales tax registration. Someone is, it's, Good to get the advice because you need research, due diligence, advice, uh, and then the advisors tend to um, tend to move over to the to sovereign who actually do the doing for the benefit of the client. Um, so that's that bit of message uh, conveyed to you all. Now, a question, not a controversial one, uh, because we know the challenges um, all of us uh, in the panel about setting up in China. Let's navigate away from the, the COVID um, um, the COVID stance um, and the and that will will emerge from that. It will become easier worldwide. We know that it's relatively um, it's a relative challenge to have a foreign company set up in China, be it a representative office, a branch office, a wholly owned foreign enterprise. It's probably a struggle to do it in less than two months. Um, and you've definitely got to have people on the ground to assist, which we do. Um, 29th easiest nation to undertake business, Stephen. How easy or what are the challenges in physically expanding and setting up in Japan compared with China, if I may say so? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to some of the points we talked about earlier, really. It's that that level of respect, I guess, that you, you have in Japan that you, you, you probably don't have in, in, in somewhere like China, uh, particularly when it comes to your intellectual property. Um, I think there is also, um, although the likes of China does have a, a good reputation for having kind of the, the infrastructure there to, to, to manufacture products, quite whether the quality of those products are as in from China or, or anywhere near as good as you would get from um, Japan. I think there is certainly better quality that you can obtain in, in manufacturing in Japan. Um, obviously, Japan has a, a very good tech network, um, a lot of high tech businesses in, in Japan, uh, and, and some good names and brands as well that are, that are already out in Japan that we've, we've touched on earlier. So I think, and I think that all helps to, to cover a kind of easier transition, if you like, to than necessarily you would get in, in somewhere like China, where I think it is a it, it is probably a riskier environment. I think it's fair to say uh, when it comes to, to trading and doing business. Although um, there are costs, I think advantages of of, of uh, trading or, or, or operating from within China. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's probably the the biggest challenges. Stephen, thank you. And um, more practical, uh, please, from experience, uh, Samuel. China versus Japan. Just, just, 
just un uh, unmute myself there. So um, just as very speaking very, very generally, uh, Japanese companies and individuals making decisions tend to be more conservative uh, than their Chinese counterparts. So it will take longer to maybe establish that initial relationship. Um, yeah. But on the, the flip side of that is that once that relationship is in place, uh, they are incredibly uh, reliable and they will be 100% dedicated to making that work. Uh, there's no, there's no um, sort of things that, that's going to go on behind your back, shall we say, um, as can happen in some other places. Um, they're very, very proud um, of what they do and there's a lot of respect. Uh, and once that good relationship has been built, and that, that is key to it, once that key um, sort of mutual respect is in place between your company and your Japanese counterpart, uh, then you have nothing to worry about. They will be absolutely dedicated to making sure that it works because your reputation and their reputation are then interlinked. Uh, the same goes for manufacturing, which, which uh, was also touched on. Um, the Japanese uh, manufacturing processes, I mean, obviously everybody's familiar with Toyota and the Toyota system and that, uh, but underpinning it is this idea of, of takumi, this, this idea of the craftsman uh, um, and uh, kiwami, so making the highest possible um, standard within any given parameters. Um, okay. So these are very, very key. And at the same time, um, the, the idea of cost was mentioned. I think people would actually be surprised uh, that the costs are not necessarily as high for manufacturing in Japan as sometimes people think, particularly again, if you're going outside of the Tokyo, out of the, outside of the Kanto region, if you're going either to the north or to the west, uh, you will find that in the, the other prefectures, there are a lot of incentives to make those costs, those initial startup costs lower. And once you have a factory, for example, in place, getting highly skilled workers at relatively low cost is not as quite as difficult as some people would think it actually is. Interesting. And as we are just losing the audience a little bit here, I've gone uh, 10 minutes over, but we've had plenty of questions coming in. Um, last comment, really. Um, the um, Is it a protected culture, protected corporate culture in terms of the ability to obtain immigration residency visas? Uh, I'm not just talking about the owner and manager in the in the UAE, Bahrain. Uh, you set up a company and you get immigration, full stop. It's one of the easiest places uh, to uh, relocate to in terms, of in, in terms of moving there as a physical person on the basis that you set up a business which is sustainable. Um, Japan, how, how protected is it? How difficult is it? Um, clearly, there's, they're going to protect, Japan is going to protect um, the, the Japanese, uh, quite rightly so. But how open are they, Stephen? Um, on an immigration policy, if I may ask. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, Simon. Sorry, I'm not Steve, sure. I think it should be more one for Samuel. Samuel, sorry, Samuel. Sure. Um, so getting a business visa or, or a sort of working visa there is is not too difficult once you have your local sponsors or your your local contacts in place. Uh, they will push that process through. Getting Japanese nationality is, is a completely different story. That's a very long and complicated process. Um, just to focus on the situation specifically at the moment, um, as of this week, they're increasing the number of people who can enter Japan uh, from 3,500 up to 5,000 uh, entrants per day. Um, and that is with um, a strong bias for research, humanitarian and business. So there's been a lot of pressure from Keiren Dan from the, the, the Japanese business community to um, sorry, I'm sorry, the Japanese business community to um, to open up the country for business. Um, and that is starting to filter through. There's still a big waiting list. Um, they reckon there's about 150,000 people uh, waiting to get in. So that just gives you some idea. Wow. Um, but there's a huge push from the business community to open up uh, and to get uh, people in. Uh, to get things, get, to get sort of the, the, the wheels of international business turning again. Okay, very good. Useful to uh, quite a number. It's quite quite revealing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying on uh, just 13 minutes later than the scheduled time. Um, great to have you along today. Um, um, a good audience. Thank you for your questions. 
Um, it's a, a pleasure to host and chair this event. Thanks to uh, Miguel and uh, other uh, colleagues of Sovereign, Tiffany and Jess, for making this happen. Uh, you've got our contact details there, ladies and gentlemen. Stuart, Stephen. Can I just, can, can I just can I just apologise? Yeah, I, I've realised I'm, I'm responsible for the contact page, and I haven't put John David uh, well, okay. contact details on it. And could you, you put me? Steve in, although... gets all the work. So. Good. And you've got to put me in, although I'm quite easy to find, I'm told. So um, anyway, so you've got John. Um, sorry, you've got Stuart, uh, Stephen, Samuel. Um, but you can dial us up on LinkedIn and other social media um, engines, and we're very easy and transparent to find uh, but uh, the revamped presentation um, with all our contact details on including um, including Stephen and myself will be with you uh, by tomorrow uh, any questions any one-to-ones you need you'll have the the contact details and you're so easy to find us so any one-to-ones uh, a video call um, a zoom an MS teams whatever you fancy uh, you know where to get us and that will be completely without obligation um, the same, obviously, with Stuart and myself. Um, thank you for being a great audience um, and pleasure hosting and sharing. And I'd just personally like to thank you, or personally like to convey my thanks to John, Stephen, Stuart and Samuel for this dynamic um, webinar. And uh, maybe we'll follow up um, later in the year with, with as a compliment or something similar, uh, depending on the, the feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close that now. Thank you for your undivided attention. Um, you, stay well, you. safe, and uh, see you all very soon. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, delegates. Good. Goodbye.